The sprawling legal systems of modern countries may seem pretty confusing at times, but imagine how hard it would be to get justice if our laws weren't even written down. That's how it was in Athens before the time of Draco, when there was no written code of laws. Just as poems were spread orally for centuries, so too were the laws, and you can imagine this caused quite a few problems. When Draco, the first legislator of Athens, was commissioned by the city to codify a written set of laws, he may have created more problems than he solved. Oppressive institutions like debt slavery were codified, so while there was more structure to the justice system after Draco, it definitely wasn't more equal. While we know almost nothing about him, we do know a few things about the political situation in Athens and why Draco is now more infamous than anything. Hey, I'm Matt, you're watching Nothing New, and today we're exploring Draco's constitution, the first of its kind in Athens. We're gonna see why Draco's name has turned into the modern adjective draconian, which refers to harsh or unforgiving laws or rules. But first, if you're interested in ancient culture and philosophy, make sure to subscribe and hit the bell. We have new videos coming out every week. And if you wanna know what videos are coming out over the next few months, make sure to stick around till the end where I have a little channel update talking about the next big subjects I'm covering. Anyways, let's get into it. We know almost nothing about Draco, just that he was summoned by the aristocrats of Athens to construct a written constitution. But we do have a picture of the chaotic political environment that may have necessitated better laws. In a world where access to justice was limited to those with power and land, conflicts often devolved into bloody feuds. Few events stand out from the sparse records we have of early Athens, except for one bloody coup ten years before the laws of Draco. The conspiracy of Cylon gives us a hint of the political instability of this time period, when, in or around 632 BC, an Olympic victor named Cylon seized the moment of popular discontent and tried to become tyrant of Athens. Along with a group of supporters and inspired by the oracle at Delphi, Cylon attempted to seize the Acropolis, but they were forced to take refuge in the Temple of Athena after being surrounded by soldiers. Cylon and his brothers were able to escape, but when food began running low, his supporters had no choice but to surrender to the Nine Archons, who promised they would be spared. They did not entirely trust their promise, however, and so to retain the protection of the goddess, they tied a rope around the statue and left the temple holding onto the rope. When the rope finally snapped, the Archon Megacles and his soldiers massacred the rebels. While the coup was unsuccessful, many believed that Megacles had committed sacrilege, and therefore him and his entire family were banished from the city. Even the bodies of dead relatives were exhumed from their graves and cast beyond the city limits. And it didn't end there. The Cylonian curse that stained his family would go on to play an interesting role in the history of Athens, since his family, the Alcmyonidae, would produce famous figures such as Cleisthenes, Pericles, and Alcibiades. Miasma is what the Greeks called a curse, and it reflects the belief that a curse was a contagious pollution, as if it were some disease. Which is why, whenever something went wrong in Athenian society, someone would usually suggest that they should once again expel the polluted Alcmyonidae clan. Today, we would probably agree that the son should not be punished for the sins of the father, but ancient Greece was a very different society in these respects. As we explored in the ostracism video, group responsibility was valued over individual liberty. Just like the gods may punish an entire city for the impiety of one individual, the family was also seen as equally responsible for the action of one of its members. But now we're getting off track. The point is that the main issue Draco had to solve was the issue of violence. By codifying the law, Draco made the state the final arbiter of justice in all cases of homicide, intentional or otherwise, instead of letting the family settle it themselves through even more violence. Before Draco, the only recourse one had if they were accused of murder was to hide in a sanctuary until you could agree to terms, usually a monetary compensation. Now murder cases were judged by a body of magistrates, and the homicide laws of Draco were the only laws which were retained by Solon's constitution. While no copy of Draco's code exists, except for one in Aristotle's Constitution of Athens which is almost surely inaccurate, we know one general fact. The punishments were incredibly severe in proportion to the crimes. The usual penalty for even minor crimes was almost always death. The Athenian orator Demides, living in the 4th century BC, remarked that the laws of Draco were written with blood instead of ink. Plutarch says this is why Solon, in the first place, he repealed the laws of Draco, all except those concerning homicide, because they were too severe and their penalties too heavy, 
for one penalty was assigned to almost all transgressions, namely death, so that even those convicted of idleness were put to death. And those who stole salad or fruit received the same punishment as those who committed sacrilege or murder. Why were the punishments so severe? Once again, according to Plutarch, Draco himself, they say, being asked why he made death the penalty for most offenses, replied that in his opinion, the lesser ones deserved it, and for the greater ones, no heavier penalty could be found. They would have been inscribed and displayed in public on axones and kirbes, which were revolving wooden beams and stone pillars that stood in the royal stoa. But since the backwards practice of debt slavery continued under Draco's constitution, the fundamental divisions in society were never addressed. Aristotle says how, the many were in slavery to the few, the people rose up against the upper class, the strife was keen, and for a long time the two parties were ranged in hostile camps against one another. Until at last, by common consent, they appointed Solon to be mediator and archon, and committed the whole constitution to his hands. But there were some innovations that were made before Solon had to come and fix things up. These are the ordinances which Aristotle says were enacted by Draco. The franchise was given to all who could furnish themselves with military equipment. The nine archons and the treasurers were elected by this body from persons possessing an unencumbered property of not less than ten minas. The less important officials from those who could furnish themselves with military equipment. And the generals and commanders of the cavalry from those who could show an unencumbered property of not less than a hundred minas, and had children born in lawful wedlock over ten years of age. There was also to be a council, consisting of 401 members, elected by lot from among those who possessed the franchise. Both for this and for the other magistries, the lot was cast among those who were over 30 years of age, and no one might hold office twice until everyone else had had his turn, after which they were to cast the lot afresh. If any member of the council failed to attend when there was a sitting of the council or of the assembly, he paid a fine. The Council of Areopagus was guardian of the laws and kept watch over the magistrates to see that they executed their offices in accordance with the laws. Any person who felt himself wronged might lay a claim before the Council of Areopagus on declaring what law was broken by the wrong done to him. But as has been said before, loans were secured upon the persons of the debtors, and the land was in the hands of a few. While Draco did take some steps to stop judges from ruling based on their personal preferences, by establishing a system of law, it was clearly not enough and would require a new lawgiver to fix things, which is why about 25 years later, Solon would be chosen as Archon to reform the constitution. So what was the assembly in the council? We'll be fleshing out the structure of government in Athens more as we explore the lives of Solon and Cleisthenes, but before we go, I think I should at least introduce you to these important and novel institutions. Christopher Blackwell of Stoa.org says that the Council of 500 represented the full-time government of Athens. It consisted of 500 citizens, 50 from each of the 10 tribes who served for one year. The council could issue decrees on its own regarding certain matters, but its main function was to prepare the agenda for meetings of the assembly. The council would meet to discuss and vote on preliminary decrees, and any of these that passed the council's vote went on for discussion and voting in the assembly. As for the assembly, he tells us that the assembly was the regular gathering of male Athenian citizens to listen to, discuss, and vote on decrees that affected every aspect of Athenian life, both public and private, from financial matters to religious ones, from public festivals to war, from treatises with foreign powers to regulations governing ferry boats. Like I said, we'll be exploring the government of Athens more in later videos. We just needed to take a moment and appreciate the beginning of the two most famous bodies of government in Athenian democracy. So let's talk about what's coming up next. This video is the first in a new series exploring the famous lawgivers and tyrants of the Archaic period and all the history that surrounds them. Coming up next is Solon, then the Pisistratids and Cleisthenes. The pre-Socratic philosophy series is wrapping up next week with the Atomists. And the week after that, we'll have one of the last videos in our Greek culture series, a comprehensive look at slavery in ancient Greece. But mainly, we'll be starting up two new series. The first will be exploring the philosophy of Socrates and Plato by working our way through the dialogues. To start off, we'll be talking about the Socratic problem and the trial of Socrates, then transition into Platonic philosophy as we get into the middle and late dialogues. Along the way, we'll also be doing a series on the major sophists, so don't think we miss thinkers like Protagoras. 
we'll cover him and all the rest soon enough. I hope to have a good rotation of videos where one week we'll be dissecting one of Plato's dialogues, another week I'll be telling you about some famous thinker like I've been doing, and the next we'll be covering some important point of history or culture. Just like we had to work our way through the pre-Socratics to get to Plato, we need to cover some basic ground before we can get into the big names of Greek history. Herodotus, Thucydides, and Xenophon. But when we get there, it'll be great because we'll already have all the context we need to really dive into these topics instead of just skimming the surface. I'm debating covering Hesiod and Homer. There's already so much great content out there already on them, but I'd definitely like to dive into the playwrights at some point. There's a lot you can learn about Greek culture in the theater department. Anyways, that's all for today. Make sure to like the video if you learned something new, and don't forget to subscribe and leave a comment. I hope you enjoyed the video, and I'll see you next week.